After a full morning in Arles, we traveled back to Avignon. Having enjoyed an evening stroll around the Palais des Papes the night before, we were looking forward to a privileged access tour of the Palais with Philippe. The building, one of the most significant Gothic structures in Europe, was fascinating. But it was Philippe's tour of the garden that gave me the most insights into the lives of the popes who lived there. Now, we are in the Grand Palace, the Grand Dame, probably Grand Monsieur, of Avignon, the center, the Palais des Papes. It is the centerpiece of the city and for many years, the centerpiece of the papacy. I know a little bit about the palace. I know it was built in the 14th century and there were 70 popes when the papacy moved from Rome. But luckily, I have an expert to fill in the blanks and share a lot more information with us today. I'd like to introduce Philippe, who Hello. will share all the history and exciting tales of the Palais des Papes here in Avignon. It's lovely Hello. to meet you. Thank you for lovely coming. Lovely to meet you too as well. Um, tell us about the Palais. Uh -huh. So the Pope's Palace is actually the witness of the presence of the Popes in Avignon in the 14th century. And we have nine Popes living nine in here. Nine Popes? I read the, seven. <laughs> well, no, nine, and for 100 years. Which, oh, I stand corrected. <laughs> which means that for 100 years, the, uh, the seat of the Catholic Church was here in Avignon. So on March 9th, 1309, which was a Saturday, if I recall, oh, very that good. day <laughs> Avignon won the lottery because that changed the uh, history of Avignon forever. Oh, and so the popes moved here from Rome. All right. Was the palace here at the time, or was there a building, or they erected it from ground there up? There were a few buildings right here where we're standing, where the pope's the palace is standing right now. There was the uh, bishop's palace, and this is actually the building the pope, the first pope, settled in when he came to Avignon. And at, at first, probably the idea was not to stay too long, okay. to, be, uh, to be honest, but then eventually... Uh, the stay uh, became longer and eventually they decided to have a, a building built that would, that would fit the, uh, the function of the Pope, of course. Or the majesty the of majesty, the papacy. Right, yeah. uh -huh. Can I back up though, what caused mm -hmm. them to leave Rome? So many political reasons. Uh, the situation in Rome is not good, the city is on the verge of a civil war, plus the Pope is having problems with the French king at the time. And beware, in those days, we are not in France, we are in Provence, which oh, is a country of its own. An important distinction. Right, but France was right on the other side of the river. There's the River Rhone that runs through Avignon, and on the other side was France. So it was some sort of a political step. The Pope was getting closer to France. He was showing the French king was, he it it wanted to show the French king that he was willing to work out all the different issues they were having. And at the same time, the situation in Rome was not good anyway, so it might as well be somewhere else. So it was in, in part a power play. I, we could mention right, many yeah. current events that were similar, but we'll stay out of current politics. Mm, yes. <laughs> so they built the palace then. Mm -hmm. 18 for, year, in 18 years. 18 years. Yeah, which, and what's standing here today is as it was yes, at, pretty, uh, pretty after much, the end of 18 years. Pretty much. The building was built in 18 years, then it became the house of the Pope during all the, the time they were in Avignon, when they left Avignon to finally go back to Rome, this was used by the ambassadors of the Pope. Uh -huh. And throughout uh, the seven, uh, 15, 16, 17, 18th century, and that's only uh, during the French Revolution that this was actually taken away from the Pope. We didn't ask the Pope his, <laughs> his, uh, his opinion, we took it away from him. And, um, we are uh, turning into barracks for soldiers for a moment. Okay. And now this is a place that you can visit, but this, this is also the convention center of Avignon in the, in the building, and there are the archives of the region. Rem remember that this is the biggest Gothic structure in Europe. Uh, it's as big as four cathedrals or 2.5 uh, soccer fields. Oh, it is huge. Well, it we climbed huge. enough steps to get up here that I'll, that I'll believe you. <laughs> yes. It, it's like magnificent to, um, to come to current day pretty quickly, and we'll back up in some of the more historic facts. But you were telling me about the Arts Festival through July. Right. Tell me how it's used as an arts center. Ah, 
Well, that started in 1949. Uh, there was an uh, art exhibition in the Pope's Palace and they decided to have a few plays in the Pope's Palace. And uh, so they did it. And it did so well that they decided to renew the experience the next year and then the next year and then the next year. And then it started growing, growing, growing. And uh, in 1949, they represented they performed uh, three plays, and this year in 2022, uh, they performed all over the city 1,500 plays. Through the month of July. Throughout the month of July. So. It, last night, we came up and were visiting, uh, walking around the courtyard outside the palace, and now hearing about the plays and having spent the evening walking out there, it's very organic to the city. It's living. It's still a living palace. It may be a Gothic structure, but it... it yeah, yeah, it's yeah. magnificent in it's, that it is your centerpiece in Avignon, yeah, but it is integrated. This is the is heart of the city. This, oh. is, uh, yeah, this is the building here. This is, people know it, the people meet in front of the Pope's Palace. This is, uh, imagine in the, in the in Second World War, Avignon got bombed. Not for a long time, but it got bombed. And the place, the people felt the safest was actually the Pope's Palace, which oh. you can see way above in the sky because it's so big, but somehow... It wasn't for a them, it was No, for them it was just... If there was a, a safe place in Avignon, that could only be the Pope's Palace. And so people rushed into the Pope's Palace. Oh, that, that's good. And they were safe. And here. they were safe, yeah. Oh, that is wonderful. <laughs> um, I'm hopping all over the place and my apologies, but you can't help but notice, except for some exquisite frescoes, it's empty. Yes. And I've read one of the popes was rather a lush, love luxury. <laughs> Maybe yes. not just one, you can correct uh, me. Uh, there was one. There was indeed one, Clement V, who was the, the fourth pope of Avignon, who was considered to be the, uh, uh, how would I say, the... Um, uh, the, the fancy, posh kind of uh, Maybe connoisseur pope. is a better word. Right, yes. <laughs> but uh, he was the one having the huge uh, banquets in the Post Palace. We know that he had 300 pounds of gold ware, a pure uh, 24 carats gold ware, oh uh, that he would eventually mail to have some, uh, some cash if he needed some. Uh, oh my God. And uh, he's the one that actually got most of, the, most of the frescoes that survived, and you can see nowadays, were painted during his, his, period. Uh, his period. And uh, yeah, it was, oh. uh, it, it was, the, uh, it was the, the big one. Have the yeah. artifacts, the decorative arts, been lost, or do we still have Well, them? the rest is just like, uh, like anybody else. Popes are just like anybody else. In the end, when, you, uh, when they move and they go to another place, where well, they take the furniture with them. So when they went back to Rome, we, we have the uh, inventory. Oh, uh, they took Yeah, they took everything back to Rome. And then there were so many pe different people living in the post palace that the, the furniture would renew, the tapestries, the the chairs, whatever, and so uh, it's been a constant change and French Revolution and soldiers, so mm -hmm. that's why it's true there's not much left to see, but uh, when you tour the Post Palace, there's also, uh, there are images, computer images that you can oh. look at where you, uh, you get to see how the Post Palace and used to be. visualize yeah, when it was fully decorated. Oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> so I, the building itself it, is fascinating, but it would be wonderful to see. Can you show me around sure, the palace? Of course. Yeah, the tour of the Pope's Palace is a real trip back in time. Oh, <laughs> thank you. This has been a great introduction, and I'm looking forward to exploring right. now. Well, my pleasure. Let's oh, go. Oh, thank you. kitchens mm -hmm. and this doesn't look like any of them ah. but I trust you so explain <laughs> where we are so that looks like a regular room when you first enter yes but then you look up and then you see oh. that we are in a fireplace so we're not really in the kitchen we'd rather we're in the oven we're in the middle in of the, the middle oven. of the oven. This On is actually, a day that it's 100 degrees outside. Thank you very much. You're welcome so it feels to make you feel what they might have felt in those days 
because imagine that place with a big fire right in the middle with Boy, 10 cows been. roasting. 10 the, cows. Yeah, the, the, the heat must have been unbearable. But I wouldn't, why wouldn't you do for the Pope, right? So, uh, but uh, yeah, this is where they would roast, they would prepare the meat for the, for the Pope. And they had two rooms like this one. That wasn't the only kitchen. They had two ovens. Uh -huh. Two so they, rooms like right. this with heat going full time all summer, right. all winter. Which means that they could eventually have 20 cows roasting at the same time for the uh, guests of the, uh, of the Pope. It, it is impressive to look up at the chimney. Yes, it is, uh, it is about uh, uh, 45 feet high. Oh. What so do you want to show us next? <laughs> I'm ready to get out ah, of the oven. We might have a look at the gardens as well. Where I, would they get the vegetables? The gardens sound much cooler. Let's All try right, that. Let's go. Philippe, so no, these okay. are the Pope's gardens. Are Correct. these how they were in That's medieval times? That's pretty much the way they were in the uh, 1300s. Obviously, we don't have uh, any uh, pictures of the Pope's palace. The very first uh, painting of the Pope's palace was actually made in the 1500s. So you can imagine 200 years later. A little but, different. Uh, what we uh, gathered from the uh, uh, accounting books and, and, and stories as well and books, we know that it was pretty much this way, which is very nice, very tidy, all everything very well organized. Can we go down and walk through them? Yeah, sure. That One, sounds two. much better. <laughs> Thank you. So, Philippe, these are the Pope's gardens, as right, much as you know correct. how they were in the Middle Ages? This is, yeah, pretty much the way they, uh, they were, and they were, uh, that's the place where the Pope would relax, and that's the place also where they would grow vegetables and fruits and uh, herbs as well, which were very important in the Middle Ages. What uh, is this plant? So this one is marshmallows. I haven't heard uh, of marshmallows. And uh, they would use it, uh, they would use the stick to, uh, for the babies to chew on for when their teeth are hurting. Oh, okay. But I wonder how many babies were living in the palace with the popes? <laughs> ah, that we don't know. You mean like sons and daughters? Uh, I don't know. I'm not No, no, no. The pope didn't have any sons and daughters. He only had nephews and nieces. Oh, thank you. Thank you. How proper. <laughs> how proper. And then, for example, they would burn this underneath the cradles. That's tansy. And in the Middle Ages, they thought that if you burn this in the cradles, the baby will, uh, would grow uh, healthy and educated and handsome, pretty. So that was really a, that was a great thing that to do. Is, I'm going to take some home for the grandchildren. <laughs> I'm sure they don't need them. Now, I recognize <laughs> lavender, of right. course, uh -huh. ubiquitous in Provence. Exactly. So lavender. It's the same in the time of the popes. Exactly. That's a, that's a local plant. And this is a soothing plant. It's relaxing. Uh, when you are bitten by your bee, you can put it on the, on the string, yeah, and it's, uh, it's soothing. Uh, rosemary, uh, which is yes. very good for your stomach, and they say as well that it's very good for your mind. Ah. And there's a tradition in Provence that say when you are when you are taking the, your driving test, you have to get a, a piece of a rosemary in your pocket, and that's how you're going to get your driving license. Okay, I know a lot that's of American teenagers <laughs> that want that. Yeah. And I see fruit trees. Were they? Yes. Is that typical uh -huh. that the popes had fruit trees? Yes. There's a lime. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, there were all types of different trees, cherry trees, apple trees, but also limes and uh, pomegranates and oranges. Those were fancy trees that uh, not everybody could afford. So, of course, that was always a, it was a, a, a good sign for the pope to have those trees in his own garden. Uh, mm -hmm. Good sign or a bad sign, depending ah. on what the population knew. <laughs> right. <laughs> but this is such a perfect solarium for the plants. They could probably grow year-round. Yes, they do. They do. Ah. And then, then uh, right here, there's just a few, uh, few, few uh, flowers that uh, grow on very arid and dry uh, uh, I... land. And, uh, yeah. um, and the some... popes could look down from their windows right. and enjoy their gardens when they didn't want to walk in them. Mm -hmm some vines as well there are some vines here and there because again wine was the uh, was the main uh, beverage in the uh, in the middle ages they wouldn't drink water 
uh, you never know what, I mean, the water was not And they must have safe. had their own vineyards outside the Palais, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they had the grapes here mm -hmm. as well. And uh, yeah, there's a, there's a fountain as well over there, which is the symbol of the four rivers that run in uh, Eden, in heaven. So the idea as well is to uh, try to recreate what heaven, uh, heaven might have been, uh, or what they thought heaven w looked like in the 1300s. In the garden. Yeah. Well, I must say they've captured a little bit of heaven, except maybe the temperature. <laughs> and I imagine yeah. somewhere else is this temperature today. <laughs> so, uh, Thank you. Yeah, well, you can imagine how, it must, how hot it must be down there if it's hot up here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one way to look at it and one way to inspire people to behave. Thank you. These You're were welcome. gorgeous. And you learned such a glimpse of the life of everyone when uh -huh. you see what they're growing. Mm -hmm. Back up the stairs. Yes. brought me to the very top of the Palais des Papes on the very hottest day of the year. You're welcome. But I'll forgive you because it's been wonderful learning about the palace, the history, the gardens, the kitchen. It's been beautiful and the view from the top is worth it. I can't thank you enough. Well, my pleasure. I, uh, I love it. If you enjoyed it, that's that's what the uh, tour of the post Palace is as well, just to try to understand how people could live back in those days because those were not uh, easy days. So uh, it's, uh, that's how we get to, uh, we learn and, uh, and we see that uh, we're actually quite a good, better, we're better off now in the 21st century than in the 14th century. Thank you again though for everything and I hope our guest will come and see more of the palace than we could show them today. But there's so much more here. But I'm going to end my visit looking at this gorgeous view out at the river we're going to be sailing on.